Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. Chapter 8 opens in the aftermath of Caesar's reinstatement of Cleopatra to the throne, marking a period of both opulence and impending tumult for Egypt. As Cleopatra indulges in the splendor befitting her position, shadows of dissent and the specter of Rome's influence loom. This chapter delves into the final days of Caesar, detailing his expansive campaigns, the intricacies of his relationship with Cleopatra in Rome, and the political machinations leading to his dramatic assassination. Join us as we explore the pivotal moments that redefine the future of Egypt and its queen, setting the stage for a new era in the wake of Caesar's death. Witness the unfolding of history, where ambition, betrayal, and a quest for power converge in the twilight of one of Rome's most legendary figures. Cleopatra Chapter 8 The Fall of a King, The Rise of a Queen The war by which Caesar reinstated Cleopatra upon the throne was not one of very long duration. Caesar came to Egypt to find Pompey at the beginning of August. The war ended, and Cleopatra was securely established by the end of January. So the conflict, although intense, was very short. It only disrupted the peaceful and commercial activities of the Alexandrians for a few months. The war and its consequences did not reach far into the interior of the country. The city of Alexandria and the nearby coasts were the main areas of the conflict until Mithridates reached Pelusium. He did march across the delta, and the last battle took place inland. However, only a small part of Egypt was directly impacted by the war. The majority of the people, who lived in the fertile lands near the Nile, and in the long valley that reached deep into the continent, were unaware of the conflict, except for vague and distant rumors. The farmers continued their work without interruption, and everything went well. When the conflict finally ended, and Cleopatra took control peacefully, she discovered that her empire's resources were hardly affected. She used the abundant revenues she received to live a life of luxury, magnificence, and splendor. The damage to the palaces and other public buildings in Alexandria caused by the fire and the siege was repaired. The broken bridges were repaired. The obstructed canals were reopened. The seawater was stopped from entering the palace cisterns. The debris from demolished houses was cleared. The barricades were removed from the streets. The damage to the palaces caused by military equipment or the occupation of the Roman soldiers was fixed. In short, the city was quickly restored to its previous order and beauty as much as possible. The burned manuscripts of the Alexandrian Library, totaling 500,000, could not be recovered. However, in every other aspect, the city soon regained its former splendor. Cleopatra even attempted to recover the loss in relation to the library. She fixed the destroyed buildings. Later in her life, she gathered around one or two hundred thousand rolls of manuscripts to start a new collection. However, the new library never became as famous and well-regarded as the old one. The previous rulers of Egypt, who were Cleopatra's ancestors, usually used the vast revenues they obtained from the farmers in the Nile Valley for ambitious purposes, as already explained. Cleopatra now appeared to be inclined to use them for indulging in luxury and enjoyment. The Ptolemies used their resources to build big structures and establish impressive institutions in Alexandria. This was done to make the city more glorious and to increase its reputation. Cleopatra, however, as was to be expected of a young, beautiful, and impulsive woman who suddenly found herself in a prominent position with immense wealth and power, spent her royal funds on personal extravagance and lavish parties. She decorated her palaces, constructed beautiful boats for enjoyable trips on the Nile, 
and spent large amounts of money on clothing, carriages, and extravagant parties. In fact, her spending on these and similar things during the beginning of her reign was so excessive that she is seen as surpassing any previous or subsequent limits of indulgence in luxurious living, personal exhibition, and grandeur. Any simplicity of character and kindness she may have possessed in her earlier years naturally diminished over time due to the influences of the life she was now leading. She was still beautiful and fascinating, but she began to grow selfish, heartless, and scheming. Her little brother, who was only 11 years old when Caesar arranged their marriage, became a source of jealousy for her. He was too young to have any real part in ruling or influencing his sister's decisions and enjoyment. But he was getting older. In a few years, when he turned 15, he would become king and marry Cleopatra, following Caesar's plans and the laws of Egypt. Cleopatra strongly opposed the change in her relationship with him and the government. Just before it was about to occur, she ensured that he was poisoned. His death freed her from all restrictions, just as she had desired. From that point forward, she ruled independently. Throughout the rest of her life, Cleopatra experienced continuous success in terms of wealth, power, and other external aspects of prosperity. She had no moral or ethical concerns that would prevent her from fully and freely indulging in her desires. Additionally, she had ample resources to satisfy those desires. The only thing that prevented her from being happy was that she couldn't satisfy her desires and emotions when they went beyond the limits set by God and nature to control them. While Cleopatra relished her opulent and grand early years as a ruler, Caesar was actively and successfully expanding his empire through conquest. After Pompey's death, he would have naturally assumed supreme power immediately. However, his prolonged stay in Egypt and his well-known involvement with Cleopatra provided encouragement and strength to his enemies in different regions of the world. In fact, a rebellion started in Asia Minor, which he had to quickly suppress, was the main reason for his leaving Egypt. Other strategies to oppose Caesar's authority were devised in Spain, Africa, and Italy. His military skill and energy were very impressive. His mere presence had a great influence over people. Moreover, it was astonishing how quickly he moved between continents and kingdoms. In a short time after leaving Egypt, he had conducted successful campaigns in all three known continents. He effectively eliminated all opposition to his power and returned to Rome as the undisputed ruler of the world. Cleopatra, who had been following his career with pride and joy, finally decided to go to Rome and visit him there. The Romans, however, were not very welcoming to her. This was a time when all kinds of vices were tolerated, but people's moral instincts were still able to see through her wickedness. Arsinoe was also in Rome during this time when Caesar was there. He had taken her to Rome after his return from Egypt, as a prisoner and as a symbol of his victory. His intention was to keep her as a captive to be displayed in his triumph. A triumph, as practiced by ancient Romans, was a grand celebration awarded by the Senate to top military commanders upon their return from distant campaigns, where they achieved notable conquests or extraordinary victories. Caesar combined all his victories into one. They were celebrated when he returned to Rome for the final time, after successfully conquering the world. The processions of this victory lasted for four days. In fact, there were four separate victories, one on each day for the four days. The ovations celebrated the wars and conquests in Gaul, Egypt, Asia, and Africa. The processions included prisoners, trophies, weapons, banners, pictures, images, wagons of plunder, captive princes and princesses, wild and tame animals, and everything else the conqueror brought home from his campaigns. These spectacles aimed to arouse the curiosity and admiration of the city's people and highlight the magnitude of the conqueror's achievements. Certainly, the Roman generals, while involved in faraway wars, wanted to bring back notable prisoners and valuable spoils from the enemy. 
they aimed to enhance the diversity and grandeur of their triumphal processions that celebrated their victories upon returning home. Caesar, for instance, brought Arsinoe from Egypt and kept her captive in Rome until he finished his conquests and the time for his triumph came. She, of course, was part of the victorious procession on the Egyptian day. She walked right in front of the chariot that Caesar rode in. She was in chains, just like any other prisoner, although her chains, as a sign of her high status, were made of gold. The impact on the Roman people of witnessing the sad and distressed princess, moving slowly among the symbols and spoils of violence and looting, was not good for Caesar. The people felt sorry for her and sympathized with her suffering. Her distress reminded them of Caesar's neglect of his responsibilities as a Roman minister by staying in Egypt with Cleopatra for so long. In short, the admiration for Caesar's military achievements that had been strong in his favor seemed to be shifting, and the city was filled with complaints against him even during his triumphs. Actually, Caesar's pride and desire for glory made him try too hard to make his triumphs more impressive than any conqueror before him. However, this ended up having the opposite effect of what he intended. The story of Arsinoe is a good example of this. If it weren't for the sad sight of Arsinoe in the group, people might have forgotten about it. There were other similar examples, such as the feasts. Caesar spent huge amounts of money on feasts and spectacles for the people to celebrate his triumph, using the plunder he obtained from his campaigns. While many people were pleased with the extravagant offerings, the majority of the Roman people were angry about the wastefulness and extravagance that was evident everywhere. Instead of impressing people with his achievements in Egypt, such as removing one queen from power and bringing her back as a captive to Rome, only to replace her with another queen, he faced criticism and blame for his actions there. For several days, Rome was filled with rioting and wild parties. The people, instead of being happy with this abundance, believed that Caesar must have extorted a huge amount of money to afford such extravagant and wasteful behavior. There was also another way in which Caesar made people strongly dislike him, using the same methods he used to try to make them like him. The Romans enjoyed watching various types of combats in the city. These combats included fights between ferocious animals, such as dogs against each other, or against bulls, lions, or tigers. Many animals were used for this purpose. They were intentionally made angry and aggressive to fight. Occasionally, men who had been captured in war and brought to Rome as gladiators were also used in these fights. These men were forced to fight against wild animals or against each other in the amphitheaters. Caesar, knowing that the Roman assemblies loved such scenes, decided to give them the experience on a grand scale. He believed that the bigger and more intense the fight, the more enjoyment the spectators would get from watching it. As part of his preparations for the celebrations of his victory, he had a big man-made lake created near Rome. This lake was meant to be surrounded by the people of the city, and there he organized a naval battle. Many warships were brought into the lake, of the typical size used in warfare. These ships had many soldiers on board. Tyrian prisoners were placed on one side and Egyptian prisoners on the other. When everything was prepared, the two groups of ships were instructed to come closer and engage in a real battle, which was meant to entertain the large crowds of spectators that had gathered around. As the nations from which the fighters in this conflict came were enemies, and as the men fought for their lives, the battle was filled with the usual horrors of a desperate naval encounter. Many people were killed. The bodies of the fighters fell from the ships into the lake, and the water turned red with their blood. There were also land battles on a large scale. In one of these battles, there were 500 foot soldiers, 20 elephants, and a troop of 30 horses on each side. This battle had more combatants than the famous Battle of Lexington, which started the American War, and the number of casualties was probably ten times higher. The scenes were so horrifying that even the fierce and merciless populace, who were supposed to be entertained by them, found them to be overwhelming. 
Caesar, in his eagerness to surpass previous exhibitions and shows, went beyond what would be considered enjoyable and entertaining, watching men being killed in bloody fights and dying in pain and despair. People were shocked. They condemned Caesar's cruelty along with other reproaches and accusations that were suppressed. Cleopatra lived openly with Caesar at his residence during her visit to Rome, and this made a lot of people very displeased. In fact, while people felt sorry for Arsinoe, Cleopatra was not well-liked by the public, despite her beauty, accomplishments, and charms. The public was more focused on the political actions of Caesar and his goals. Many people accused him of wanting to become a king. There were groups supporting and opposing him. Even though people were afraid to say what they really thought, their emotions became stronger as they were forced to keep them hidden. Mark Antony was in Rome at the time. He strongly supported Caesar's cause and encouraged his plan to become king. In fact, he once offered to put a royal crown on Caesar's head during a public event. However, the negative response from the public made him stop. Eventually, Caesar decided to declare himself king. He saw an opportunity in the current state of public affairs, which cannot be explained in detail here, but seemed to be in his favor. Plans were made for the Senate to grant him the royal power. The whispers and unhappiness of the people about the signs that their fears were coming true became louder and louder. And in the end, a plot was made to stop the danger by killing the power-hungry person. Two serious and resolute men, Brutus and Cassius, were the leaders of this plot. They finalized their plans, gathered their group of allies, secretly acquired weapons, and when the Senate convened, with Caesar himself presiding, they fearlessly approached him and killed him with their daggers. Antony, who had no idea about the plans of the conspirators, stood there in shock and disbelief while they carried out their act. However, he was completely powerless to help his friend. Cleopatra quickly ran away from the city and went back to Egypt. Arsinoe had left before. Caesar, either feeling sorry for her misfortunes or maybe influenced by public opinion, which seemed to be on her side against him, released her right after his triumph celebrations. However, he didn't permit her to go back to Egypt, perhaps because he was afraid she might somehow disrupt Cleopatra's government. She went to Syria as an exile, no longer a captive. We will find out later what happened to her there. Calpurnia mourned her husband's death sincerely and genuinely. She endured the mistreatment she faced as a wife with patience and without complaint, and loved her husband with unwavering devotion until the end. Nothing is more touching than the signs of her caring and worried concern on the night before the assassination. She noticed some small and unclear signs of danger that her devoted attention to her husband allowed her to see, even though Caesar's other friends missed them. These signs made her feel worried and anxious. And when the bloody body was finally brought home to her from the Senate House, she was filled with sadness and hopelessness. She didn't have any children. So she considered Mark Antony as her closest friend and protector. The next day, when there was chaos and fear in the city, she quickly gathered the money, valuable items, her husband's books, and papers from the house. She sent them to Antony to keep them safe. As the tumultuous events of Chapter 8 come to a close with the dramatic fall of Caesar, the political landscape of Rome is thrown into chaos. Chapter 9 opens in the aftermath, capturing the shock and confusion that grips the city. Mark Antony emerges as a pivotal figure, grappling with the power vacuum, while the discovery of Caesar's will ignites further turmoil. This chapter delves into the intricate dance of diplomacy and power struggles as Brutus and Cassius lead the opposition, setting the stage for the rise of Octavius. Amidst this backdrop, Cleopatra's allegiance and her strategic decisions play a critical role in shaping the unfolding drama. As the chapter unfolds, we witness the formation of the Second Triumvirate, a delicate alliance fraught with internal rivalries and external threats, leading to the pivotal Battle of Philippi. 
Join us as we explore these pivotal moments in history where the fates of empires and their leaders are irrevocably intertwined.